And joining me now via Skype from New Delhi, Washington Post columnist and editor at Mojo, Barca Dutt. Um, sadly, you've been uh, personally through many of the experiences uh, like the ones we just described, including the death of a loved one. So to start, uh, I'd like to say just how sorry I am, how sorry we all are uh, about the death of your father who died of COVID just a few days ago. Um, incredibly tragic. I'm, I'm hoping that by sharing your story, our viewers might understand the depth of the crisis that's affecting so many. Thank you, Kim. Uh, it isn't an easy time uh, for me to speak, but the reason that I do and the reason that I do share my personal story uh, is, is, is because as a journalist, as a frontline reporter on the COVID story, I've been talking to literally thousands and thousands of Indians who've been devastated by the second wave. And I feel that it is my duty now to be on the other side of the camera and, and, and share my pain in much the same way as I look to them to share theirs. But there's a larger reason. And the reason is this, that I feel personally orphaned today. Uh, with my father gone, both my parents are now dead. Uh, I have nobody left, I feel alone. But what about those who are the orphans of the Indian state? I think of them today as I think of my father, because my father's last words to me were, I'm choking, please give me treatment. And I tried my best, but even being a journalist who knows doctors, an upper middle class Indian who can pay for the best private medical treatment, the ambulance, the private ambulance that ferried him to hospital had an oxygen cylinder that did not work. It got delayed because there's no green corridor for ambulances in this city, in the capital, even now. By the time we reached the hospital, because the oxygen had failed or faltered, his levels had fallen precipitously, he had to be taken into ICU. He never made it back. It's not even been a few days. It's not even been 48 hours. When we went to cremate him, there was no space at the cremation ground. There was a physical fight that erupted between multiple families. We had to call the police to cremate my father. And yet, in this moment of loss, it was difficult to even articulate and put together a bunch of sentences. I speak because I realize that despite my devastation, I was luckier than most Indians. And I was luckier than most Indians because, as I said, I think today of the orphans of the Indian state, the families that I meet outside hospitals that have shut their gates and their doors to them because they neither have beds nor oxygen. I think of the families that I meet at cremation grounds where bodies have been lying on the floor. And one man, the brother of somebody who had died, said to me in Hindi, we are now Bhagwan Bharose, translated in English, it means we've been left to be in God's hands. There's nobody to talk to us. And that is what pains me enormously, that even with our death figures reaching 3,700 almost, and by the way, I've been doing a chronicling of multiple cremation grounds across India, and I can tell you that the actual numbers are much higher than the official data is being reported. Even with this, our health minister has the audacity to say that India is better placed to fight corona than it was in 2020. Even with what's happening, we're obsessing about elections and giant rallies. Until yesterday, we even had one of our states going ahead with mass religious congregations just minutes ago. They've called that off. So I'm not just despairing today. I'm not just speaking as a daughter who's crushed. I'm speaking as an angry Indian who feels betrayed at the callousness and the tone deafness and the complete denial that I continue to see around me. Well, I mean, that's just it. Uh, you, you know, you tweeted that um, you failed your father, but I, I would argue from what you just said, uh, it was the healthcare system that, that failed him and, and millions of others in India. You know, what I want to say is that the healthcare system has clearly collapsed, but the failure has not been that of the doctors or of the hospitals or of the frontline workers. They've done their best. We have been failed by policymakers, by politicians. We've been failed by the government that did not think to put in place a contingency plan for the second wave that dismantled the jumbo COVID hospitals that had been created last year in the belief that we had beaten the first wave. We have been failed by policymakers that allowed vaccines to go out of India before our own could be vaccinated. My father had had one jab. I keep thinking 
you know, if the vaccines had started earlier and he'd got his second injection, maybe he'd still be alive today. We don't know, but maybe he'd still have had a fighting chance. We've been failed by those who allowed those election rallies to take place, those religious congregations to take place, who even today do not want to acknowledge the enormity of what's happening. And the fact is that we're making families sign consent forms before they go into hospitals saying if somebody dies from the lack of oxygen, it will not be the liability of the hospital. So whose liability will it be? Our heads going to roll? Is anyone going to take accountability for the thousands that are dying? And many, Kim, I want to remind you, are dying uncounted. Doctors and experts have told me that they believe that the data is seriously skewed, manipulated, and underreported. And the official data is this bad. Just imagine, just imagine how bad things really are. You paint a, a, a terrifying picture, and especially hearing that, um, that uh, it must be worse even than the numbers are showing. We want to thank you for sharing your story um, and sharing your pain, and we just, again, want to uh, give you our, our sincerest condolences. Thank you. Thank you All for right. having me. That was uh, Barca Duet. Thank you very much for joining us.